Hi, and welcome to the No Black Box machine learning course in JavaScript. It's a course where we code without using libraries because it's the best way to learn all inner workings in a machine learning system. And you'll greatly improve your software development skills as well. Actually, the course is a lot about software engineering, especially in the beginning, and the focus slowly shifts towards machine learning as it goes on. Our main goal is to build a web app that learns to recognize drawings. If you've seen QuickDraw from Google, it's something like that, with a few key differences I'll point out along the way. For machine learning, we need data. So I'll first teach you how to build a data collection tool. It's a drawing app that works on desktop and mobile devices. We'll later reuse this sketchpad component to build a recognizer as well. Next, I'll teach you how to process and visualize the data collected with the tool, the drawings you made when asked for help. If you missed that video and want your drawings to be used at some point, it's not too late to do it now. Then we move on to feature extraction and visualization. We build this chart component from scratch. It's a relatively big project, but worth it, because building it we practice much of the same math we later need for machine learning. We also customize it so much it becomes an essential teaching tool for what follows. Speaking of which, this is where most machine learning courses typically start. They use some existing data and features, famous datasets that are publicly available. And that's okay, it helps dive into things much quicker. But I include this part because, in my experience, it's never that easy in real life. Being able to collect data, visualize it, clean it, and shape it in a useful form are all really important steps you need to do in practice. And not understanding data well is why people fail at machine learning. Even the most sophisticated libraries fail if the data is not what you expect. But this is our data. You made part of it. So I'm pretty sure we won't have that problem. Now, the simplest learning method I can think of is the nearest neighbor classifier. I'll teach you how to implement it and integrate it with the sketchpad so it recognizes what we draw. It will work okay-ish, it's a simple method, but it can work even better if we apply data scaling, a step everybody performs when doing machine learning, but very few people can explain why, at least from what I've seen. I'll make sure you understand why it helps. We then implement the more advanced k nearest neighbors classifier and calculate its accuracy for different values of k. To understand things even better, I'll teach you how to compute decision boundaries and display them on our chart. Now, at work, I teach a version of this course in Python, and a poll I made recently shows that some of you are interested in that as well. So, the last lesson will be a review where we do the same things in Python. Spoiler alert, I'll use libraries and it will be over quite fast. Now, when I said last lesson, I mean that of phase one. This is when the course will take a short break. It will give you enough time to focus on the homework. Sorry, but if you really want to learn, following recipe videos like this is just not enough. But don't worry, they're not that hard. High school math and some programming experience is all you need. If you need to brush up on those, these videos here can help. And if you get really stuck, Join my Discord, where me and other students can help. We then begin phase two, where we learn more advanced methods like these. I actually got a pretty good accuracy using the same neural network we coded in the self-driving car course. There might be some kind of crossover happening. Let's see. Let me show you how to build a drawing app for data collection. It will ask for some information first and then tell you what you need to draw. This sketchpad also has undo and save functionalities and it works on desktop and mobile devices as well. There are some sketchy things we need to consider when designing for both. Get it? Sketchy? Because we're building a sketchpad and no, oh, no, no, no! Gonna code, debug, and have fun. Coding with Radu. Coding with Radu. Gonna prototype and design. Coding with Radu. Coding with Radu. Let's code now. We'll implement everything in this course using Visual Studio Code. And to test, we'll use a web browser. 
Today we build a web application, so let's begin by creating a new folder called web. And inside this folder we'll create our first file, creator.html. It will be a web page that we use to create data for our dataset. Now we begin to type basic HTML. And in the head, I will give this page a title. Let's call it data creator. And let's link an external style sheet, a CSS file that we will have to implement. This will hold all the styles that we need in this project. Let's close the head section and define a body where I'm going to have a div with an ID of content that will hold everything we'll implement today. And that will include a title section, this data creator using an H1 tag. And let's have a line break and then a div with ID sketchpad container. We'll implement the sketchpad today and this container is going to hold it. Let's close our content div and our body and the HTML. Save the file and now let's open the file in the browser. And we get this. The only thing we see in the page is this h1 tag from here because this line break and this container are invisible for now. We also get an error in the console here. I have the browser developer tools open and I recommend you do the same. The error here just means that we don't have the styles CSS file existing yet. Let's create it by going here and typing styles.css and inside I'm going to add basic styles for the page. For the body I'm going to set the font family to Arial and the background color will be sky blue. I will also add some styles for this content. I want it to be in the middle of the page, always. So the position will be absolute and I'm going to give it 50% from the top and 50% from the left. But this will make the top left corner of the content be in the middle of the page. So I want it to go half its width and half its height to the left and towards the top. So I'm going to write here transform translate minus 50% minus 50% and text align to center. If I refresh this, I'm going to get data creator exactly in the middle of the page. The background is blue and Arial font. Let's begin to implement our sketchpad. So we'll do that in an external JavaScript file and we'll load this at the end of the body here. So it will be in a folder called JS for JavaScript and we'll call it sketchpad.js. Let's close the script tag. And here we are going to instantiate our sketchpad in another script tag and we will define it to be on the sketchpad container like this. Let's close the script tag now and define this file. So first the JS folder, I'm going to create a folder called JS and inside of this folder I'm going to create sketchpad.js. Make sure that it's really inside of the JS folder and not in the same line with the other ones. And here we will use the class syntax. So let's define our sketchpad class and the constructor will have a container, in this case, our div from earlier and the size, let's say 400 by default. To implement the sketchpad, we'll use an HTML canvas element and I will create it here as an attribute of this class by calling document create element canvas like this. I will set the width of this canvas to be the size 
and the height of this canvas to be the size as well. And let's give it also a little bit of style. I will write this canvas dot style is equal to, and now I'm going to open a backtick to write a template literal, a string that works on multiple lines. And let's write here a background color of white and a box shadow with these properties, black. I will close the backtick here and the semicolon. So notice here this backtick, don't confuse it with the single quote. It won't work on multiple lines like this. Now let's go here and append this canvas to the container, to the div. And we can save the file, refresh the page, and here it is, our future sketch pad. To draw on this canvas, we are going to use the canvas context, the 2D context, which we get like this. And I'm storing it here in this CTX attribute of the sketchpad. And we will have to add event listeners to detect the mouse actions. I will do this using a private method, add event listener here, like this. So we will have to implement this method next. I will do it down here and it's a private method. It has this hashtag in front. It means that it cannot be called from outside this class. And the first thing that we will do is add to our canvas an unmouse down event listener like this. We will detect the unmouse down action and we will figure out the coordinates. We will do this by first getting the rectangle of the canvas bounding area with this function. And then we will obtain the mouse coordinates by taking the client X of this event minus the left side of this rectangle. So in this way, we get an X coordinate that is relative to the left side of the canvas. And the same thing for the Y coordinate relative to the top part of the canvas. This is zero, zero. Now notice here for mouse, I'm using an array syntax. So this will correspond to X coordinate and this will correspond to Y coordinate. We will be using this syntax everywhere because at some point we will start working with higher dimensions. And in this way, we don't run out of letters to use. Now let's log this mouse location and see if this code works. Save the file, refresh the page. And if I'm going to click, we can get here the coordinates. Every time I click, I see different coordinates. Closer to the top left corner, we get coordinates very close to zero. Closer to the bottom right corner, we get coordinates close to 400, 400, how we specified here the size to be. Now, these are floating point numbers with incredibly high precision. We won't need any of that and integers are enough. So I'm just going to go here and add a rounding to these values. So let's just say math round like this and let's close this parenthesis as well. Refresh. And now when we are clicking, we get these integer values that are easier to work with. Let's remove this debugging and start creating our path that we draw on the sketch path. So I will say here, this path is an array that contains the mouse. When we just click on the canvas, that's what we get one point added into this path array. And I will also mark here that the drawing has started like this. These will be attributes of the class. Let me go up here and define them. His drawing is set to false by default and the path is empty. Now we're going to do the same thing here, but for on mouse move, another event listener. I'm just going to copy everything and replace here on mouse down with on mouse move like this. 
And we will process this only if we are drawing. So we will be moving on top of the mouse all the time, but only if we are drawing. So only if is drawing, then we do something here. And we get the coordinates of the mouse, same as last time, but here we add it to the path. So we write here dot push this mouse location. And we know that is drawing is true, otherwise we wouldn't be here. So let's just remove this line and log here the length of our path. Let's also add uh, an event listener here for unmouse up. And the only thing that we do here is set is drawing to false again. And we don't actually need this parameter here anymore. We don't care where the mouse is up because the path has been modified with the last mouse move. So I'm going to save this, refresh. And now when I click and drag, the number that you see there is the number of points that have been added to the path that I'm drawing. We can't see the path just yet, but you can see it growing every time I'm moving the mouse. And if I release the mouse, now I released the mouse, and if I'm going to press it again and start dragging, I create a new path again. What happens is that here path is reinitialized with just the mouse location on mouse down. Now, before we continue, part of this code here needs to be fixed. Like this is essentially the same thing as this. Let me just remove this part from here and extract a function for getting this mouse location. So it will be a private function. Let's call it get mouse given an event parameter. I'm going to paste here this code and start to align it. And here we can just return directly these coordinates. Like so. Now this get mouse function, we can write it here as mouse is equal to this dot get mouse with the event parameter. And I can copy this for the top part here as well. Let's refresh. And the same functionality as before, but now the code is much easier to read and simpler. All we need to do now is draw on the canvas instead of logging these numbers here. So let me write here this redraw. This will redraw everything on the canvas. It's a method that we'll implement next. And I'm going to write it here, like so. We will start with clearing the canvas using the clear rect method, starting at 0, 0, the top left corner, and going all the way to canvas width and canvas height. And then we are going to draw our path. For that, I'm going to implement a draw utility object. It will have a function called path that we can specify here the context and this path, the one that we want to draw. Now let's create this draw utility object inside of its own file. I'm just going to import it here first. It's going to be called draw and let's create it in the JavaScript folder. So inside of the JavaScript folder here, we create draw.js. And we initialize our object called draw like this, and let's add the path function to it. It's going to have a context, a path, and a default color set to black. So the stroke style is going to be set to the given color, black in this case. And let's set here a line width, maybe three. We begin the path. 
And now we're going to move to the first point in the path. Now this move to typically has two parameters, but this path of zero has the x, y inside of an array. And this syntax here spreads that array out into its two components. So we can call this move to just specifying one item here. And then we will iterate from one all the way to the path length, like this, and do a line to the same syntax with path of i, like this. And then we stroke. Let's save this, refresh, and now you can see the line appearing there. And if I release the mouse and click again, it starts again, actually. So it's not good. We would like to draw multiple paths, but it's something. And before we get to multiple paths, there is one thing that I don't like very much. Maybe I can show you if I zoom in. Um, can you see when drawing, there are some corners appearing? when I change suddenly direction. I'm not sure if you can notice what I mean, but for example, this corner, this corner, this corner, they appeared out of the blue somehow. And this is because of how the line join is done. And also the line cap, this ending here that is straight, I would like it to be more round. It looks better like that. So we can change these things like so. Let's save this, refresh, and now the line cap is round. And when we change direction like that, we also have a round corner point here. So those problems don't happen anymore. Let me zoom back out. Okay, to draw multiple paths, I'm going to generate here a new function. Again, a context, paths this time, and then again, a default color set to black. And what we will do is go through all the paths. And for each path, we draw path with these properties. So what we do here is reuse this other function from above to draw multiple paths instead. And in the sketch pad, we are going to go up and rename this path to paths. Now this will be an array of arrays. And here we are going to say path dot push an array containing one point. And here where we want to add a point to the path, we now want to add the point to the last path. So Let's get the last path first. It's going to be the last one in this paths array, like this. And then we are going to push the mouse into this last path. And our redraw method is going to call draw paths, this time with paths. Let's save this, refresh, and there is an error here because I forgot to change this path into a paths as well. I should have used this right click rename symbol feature to rename it everywhere. In that way you don't make such mistakes. Now refresh. Okay, but it's not yet perfect. If I'm going to press this button here, this is how it would look like on a mobile device. And this is just not, not great. To fix this, I can go to creator HTML and here at the top in the head section, I'm going to say meta name equals to viewport. It's a viewport meta tag with the content equal to width equals device width, like this. I'm going to save this, refresh, 
and notice how the width has changed. Here at the top you can choose multiple devices if you want to try them out, but this one has a width of 375 and my canvas here is a little bit too large. So you can actually fix this by specifying here comma and then maximum scale something like 0 0.9. In this case it's going to rescale everything a little bit downwards to 90% and my canvas fits even on these smaller screens. Now we don't want users to zoom in and out on this page and we can prevent that by going here and specifying user scalable zero. But there is a big problem here. This sketchpad just doesn't work. I, I'm trying to draw now and it doesn't work. And the reason for that is that the event listeners for the touch are different than the event listeners for the mouse. So we're going to go to our sketchpad to add event listeners and here I'm going to write untouch start a new event listener I'm going to get the location from the event touches and I'm going to just call on mouse down with this so the same code from here we reuse it but we get it from the first touch because multi-touch is also possible on devices like this now we do the same thing here for untouch move and the same here for untouch end. Now if I'm going to save this, refresh, it works also in this mobile device mode. But some people have mentioned to me that it sometimes doesn't work on Apple devices. And when you try to draw, it moves the page up and down. I'm not sure if this entirely fixes the problem, but you can go to the body and say here, over scroll behavior to none. If somebody else knows how to make it even better than this, please let me know. Let's save this. And I'm going to exit now from this mode. Let's implement undo functionality. I'm going to go back to the sketchpad in the top here. After we add this to the container, I will add a few more things. First, a line break. And after that, a button, an undo button with an inner HTML set to undo. And let's append both of these to our container. Let's save this and refresh. And you can see the undo button now here. Let's add an event listener to it. I'm gonna go here at the end of this function and say undo btn, unclick. And we are going to pop from our paths and redraw everything. Refresh, draw some things, undo, and it works. But we shouldn't be able to undo things after this is empty. So I'm going to go here at the end of redraw and I will toggle the undo functionality. So if this path's length is greater than zero, this undo button is going to be enabled. Otherwise, this undo button is going to be disabled. Now, if I'm going to refresh this and undo two times, this is a disabled button here. We can make it look nicer. If we go to styles, I'm just going to add the general style for buttons 
and say, I want the cursor to be pointer. Now it's the default cursor that looks like an arrow, but the pointer is that kind of hand symbol. And I like that over buttons. Let's remove the border, set the padding, and a little bit bigger height. Border radius, make it a little bit curvy, and a dark blue color. Let's use navy. And a white color for the text. We're also going to add a different color for the hover state. I'm going to set background color to medium blue. And let's add the styles for the disabled state and also the disabled state on hover. Both of them are required. And I'll make this gray and then we can put the default cursor here. Save this, refresh, and now the button looks a little bit nicer. And when it's disabled, it looks like this and the cursor also changes. Now, if I refresh this, the undo should be disabled here. So I'm actually going to go to the sketch pad and call this redraw here in the beginning. It's going to handle that as well. And it becomes enabled as I'm drawing something. Now let's proceed to add the functionality that we need to create a data set. We have to record who the person is and to have a button to advance to the next drawing. I'm going to go here to creator and actually we also need to make this sketchpad invisible at the beginning while we ask the people who they are. So let's start with that. I'm going to go here and say style visibility is hidden in the beginning. Let me just put this div on a new line there. And up here, I'm going to start to define the other objects that we need. An input field, I will call it student. It will be a text input field. And let's have a placeholder here, type your name, like so. So I'm calling it student because I sent this to my students to fill in. And a button to advance to another object. And on click, let's set this to start. It will have a text just saying start in the beginning, but we will change that soon, you'll see. Now let's close this div, save the file, refresh the page. And now the sketchpad is invisible and we can type in here. And if we press start, nothing happens <laughs> because this start function doesn't exist yet. There is one thing that we should consider at this stage though, and that is here in the head section, let's define another meta tag for the char set and say it should be UTF-8. Many people have names that have special characters and also some people use emojis here as their name and this will support that. Now let's start to collect the data from those fields. I'm going to go here and write data, an object with three fields. The student, which is null by default. I'm also going to have a field for the session and this is going to be a unique identifier. I'm going to use the date and get time for the session and I'm also going to have an object here for the drawings. This is where we will store all the paths that people are drawing for each of the different drawings that we ask them to do. Now because my system is online and several students could theoretically be drawing at the same time, I have a more complex code on the back end to make sure session IDs are unique. But so far this hasn't been useful. All timestamps are unique. And it's not a big surprise really, given they have millisecond precision. So I won't go into more details here and keep it simple like this with just the timestamps. So let's implement our start function next. I will do it here at the bottom and say start. And 
check if there is a value provided in the student field, this input field from above. If it's empty, I'm going to say, please type your name first, an alert. And I will return. Otherwise, the code will continue here below, and I will set the student from the data to be the value from this field. I will also make this input field disappear like this. And I will make the sketch pad appear like this. Refresh. And if I press start, I'm getting this alert here. If I fill in this first and press start, I start to see the sketch pad. But this should be something else here. So let's see what things we need to draw. I'm going to go up here and start by defining an index, which thing I'm going to draw from a list. And this list is going to have the labels car, fish, house, tree, bicycle, guitar, pencil, and clock, like this. We will have another field up here for instructions, and I'm just going to use a span for this with ID instructions, like so. And at the end of the start function here, I'm going to do a few things. I will get the label of the thing that we will draw first, like this, and I will set the instructions in our HTML to be please draw a label. And then we'll also modify the inner HTML of the advance button from start to next. I will also change the on click event on the button to next. And this is going to be a new function that we will implement here. What we do inside it is we increase the index. And we are going to copy the same things from here. We are going to get another label and we are going to update the instructions like this. Now, before we increase this index, we are going to go up here and try to get the paths that were drawn using the sketch pad. So if there are paths, if there are no paths, we warn and say, draw something first and return. So the code doesn't go further, but if it goes here, we can get the label of the path that was drawn. So still this index. Uh -huh. And here we can store in the data at the drawings of the given label, the paths coming from the sketch pad like this. And the sketch pad will also need the function to reset itself, to empty the paths and redraw everything. So let's implement this too. But before that, this is a problem here, uh, redefining this label. This is going to be the next label and I'm going to copy it here as well. Now, in our sketch pad, I'm going to implement here our reset method, which is a public method. We are accessing it from outside, and this is just going to do these things here, actually. So I'm going to move them inside, and let's call reset here this dot reset. So this should still work. Let's refresh, type something here, start, please draw a car. Let's draw something. Next, please draw a fish. And let's look at our data. So in the console here, I'm going to type data and we have collected student ASD, that's the name I entered, then session, and then the drawings, so far only the car 
has two paths, one with 53 points and another 27 points. You can watch these individual points if you want, but I believe this works. Now there is a problem. If I'm going to go all the way to the end, we don't have functionality for that. So the clock is the last one and then please draw an undefined. <laughs> so let's go back to creator HTML here. And here we are going to update the instructions only if possible. So if the index is less than the labels length, then we do that. Otherwise, we are pretty much done. So we say else sketchpad container visibility hidden. We hide it. Maybe we are polite and we change this to thank you. And the button is going to turn to say save. This is because we are going to save whatever paths we have drawn locally. In the original version, this was done on my server, but here I want you to be able to save these files on your local computer. And the new function on click will be called save. Let's implement this function as well. So what we do here is we completely hide the button that says save. And the instructions are going to say what to do with the file that you will download. Take your downloaded file, place it alongside the others in the data set. This will make more sense after the next lecture. Now to create and download the file from the browser, we can make an element here, an A element, and we can set the href attribute to data plain text with this UTF-8 char set, because we may have some UTF-8 characters there. And then we will encode URI component using the stringified version of the data. So we have to convert this into a string and we will use JSON to stringify this data. So the data that we are collecting, the paths that people are drawing are going to be saved as a JSON string in a file. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation, a standard format for storing data like what we have here. It's humanly readable and most programming languages have support for it as well, like JavaScript. Duh. In JavaScript, we use JSON stringify to convert data into a JSON string and JSON parse to convert the JSON string back into an object. Now we are going to give a name to this file and I want to give the name of the session a unique name that we generated from the timestamp. And now we are going to set the attribute to download to this A element and here specify the file name as well. And finally, we need to trigger this download action. So let me first make this element invisible because I'm going to add it to the body of our document. I'm going to trigger the click and then I'm going to quickly remove it from the document. I just don't know of a better way of doing this. If you know, let me know. And this is our save functionality. Let me save this, refresh, Type a name here, start, and then car. Yeah, I'm not going to do it now. I already did it a while ago. Now house, tree, bicycle. <laughs> I know some of you guys are much better artists than I am. 
guitar, pencil, and a clock. And now thank you, save, and when we press save, we get the file here. One small thing that I still want to show you is if I'm going to type here the name and access this sketchpad, if I draw here, it works fine. But if I'm going to move out of the page, release and go back in the page, this mouse up didn't trigger because it's done on the canvas. And sometimes you might want that to happen. I mean, for example, if you want to draw uh, maybe a line like a horizon and then your line just continues there, it's not a nice user experience. So to fix that, you can go to the sketchpad and the event listener that you're going to add for on mouse up is going to be on the document instead, like this. And we have to do the same thing for the untouch end event, like this. Refresh, go here, release the mouse, and then go back in. The unmouse up has triggered, and now we can start to draw a new path. Did you follow along? Great. Please like this video if you learned something today and share it with others so they can learn as well. And if you got stuck somewhere, ask and we'll figure it out. You can also take my version from GitHub and compare. It would be nice to know if this system works on all devices, and I'd be grateful if you test it for me. There's a spreadsheet in the description where you can fill in the device name, operating system, browser version, and report if anything is wrong. Great if you propose solutions as well. Next time we check out the data I collected from you guys.